face the flag of the United States of America, recognizing the principles for which it stands. The Part 107 of the Los Angeles Superior Court, State of California, is now in session. The Honorable Michael E. Pastor, Judge presiding. Please be seated. In the case of People versus Conrad Murray, Dr. Murray is present with counsel, Mr. Chernoff, Mr. Flanagan, Mr. Gorgian, and Mr. Pena. The people are represented by counsel, Mr. Walgren and Ms. Brazil. All the jurors and all the alternates are present. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you had a productive day off yesterday. And once again, uh, thank you for accommodating us. Uh, in the time uh, when you were off, counsel and I discussed uh, exhibits and jury instructions. Uh, let me advise you that the following exhibits have been received in evidence. And you don't have to feverishly try to write down everything because you're going to get an exhibit list. With the number of exhibits in this case, we can't expect you to memorize each exhibit. Uh, so you're going to get an exhibit list, and that exhibit list is going to indicate every exhibit that has been received in evidence. You are going to receive a substantial number of exhibits in the jury room when you begin your deliberations. Other exhibits will not be presented to you at that point in the jury room, but will be available on request if you'd like to see and examine them. Some of the exhibits, which may contain forensic matter, for instance, or medication, for instance, are not, as a matter of court policy, brought into the jury room un unattended. I'm sure you can understand that. Uh, but they're available, and if you want to uh, view them, uh, you just send us a little note, and we'll have one of our bailiffs bring in that particular exhibit or exhibits. The important thing is you'll have access to any and all exhibits that are received in evidence. And the exhibits received in evidence are People's 1 through 53, 56 through 226, 228 through 229, and 239 through 244. The defense exhibits received in evidence are A through J, I'm sorry, yes, and then L through SS, DV through XX, ZZ through triple X, quadruple C through quadruple E, some of you were smiling, a quadruple G through quadruple N, and then quadruple P through quadruple W. Once again, uh, you're going to have a list, and uh, it'll be uh, pretty clear what you're receiving as exhibits and what you are not. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be providing you with the legal instructions that apply to this case. Each of you should have a copy of the jury instructions. Do all of you have that copy? It was provided to each of you, and all jurors are indicating the affirmative. As I'm going to be telling you in just a few moments, the law requires that I read the instructions to you in the open courtroom. Uh, we feel that it's appropriate to have each juror read along with me. So you have your own personal copy. You receive the master set of instructions in the jury room during your deliberations. You also have your own personal set which you review at this time and during your deliberations. And it's your personal set. It's yours to keep. And you can write on your personal set. You can make notes or comments on it if you'd like, uh, both now and uh, during deliberations. Uh, my suggestion is at some time you may want to put your seat number on your personal copy. So that way, if it gets put down, uh, you'll know where to find it. The important thing is you can feel free to write anything you'd like on your own personal copy since it belongs to you. Uh, let me indicate that while I uh, have gone over these instructions on many occasions, uh, there still may be some typographical or grammatical errors. May I suggest that you have a pen handy so that if, as I'm reading it, it becomes apparent that there is such an error, you'll be able to correct it. Uh, it should take about 28 minutes and 14 seconds for me to read these instructions to you. Uh, that's going to vary by a little bit, but it'll take just about a half an hour for me to read the instructions to you. After I do that, we'll take a break. I think you'll probably need it. Uh, and uh, we'll take a little bit of a break, and then the attorneys will begin their arguments, and I'll give you a little more information about it. So if you would turn to page one, which is always the best page, page one of the instructions. Post-trial introductory series. Members of the jury, I now will instruct you on the law that applies to this case. The law requires that I read the instructions to you in the open courtroom. I will provide you with the written master set of instructions to review in the jury room 
during deliberations. In addition, I have provided each of you with a written personal set of instructions to follow at this time and review in the jury room during deliberations. While you cannot write on the master set, you certainly may write on any personal copy. The instructions that you receive may be printed, typed, or written by hand. Certain sections may have been crossed out or added. Disregard any deleted sections and do not try to guess what they might have been. Only consider the final version of the instructions in your deliberations. You must decide the facts in this case. It is up to all of you and you alone to decide what happened based only on the evidence that has been presented to you in this trial. Do not let bias, prejudice, sentiment, sympathy, public opinion, or public feeling influence your decision. Bias includes, but is not limited to, bias for or against the witnesses, attorneys, the defendant, or the alleged victim based on disability, gender, nationality, national origin, race or ethnicity, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, or socioeconomic status. You must follow the law as I explain it to you, even if you disagree with it. If you believe that an attorney's comments on the law conflict with my instructions, you must follow my instructions. Pay careful attention to all of these instructions and consider them together. If I repeat any instruction or idea, do not conclude that it is more important than any other instruction or idea just because I repeated it. Some words or phrases used during this trial have legal meanings that are different from their meanings in everyday use. These words and phrases will be defined specifically in these instructions. Please be sure to listen carefully and follow the definitions that I give you. Words and phrases not defined specifically in these instructions are to be applied using their ordinary, everyday meanings. Some of these instructions may not apply, depending on your findings about the facts of the case. Do not assume just because I give a particular instruction that I am suggesting anything about the facts. After you have decided the facts, follow the instructions that do apply to the facts as you find them. Do not conduct any research regarding this case on your own through another person or as a group. Do not investigate the facts or the law involved in this case. Do not use a dictionary, a Bible, the internet, or any other reference materials whatsoever with regard to this case. Do not access any internet site, including but not limited to any search engine site, such as Google, Ask, Bing, etc., or any social networking site, including but not limited to Facebook, MySpace, etc., or text or tweet, or otherwise post any messages, or access any blogs regarding any aspects of this case, or the persons identified in it. Do not listen to, watch, read, hear, or otherwise have any contact with any television or radio program, book, or newspaper or magazine article regarding any of these subjects. Do not perform any experiments or visit the scene of any event involved in this case. If you happen to pass by the scene, do not stop or investigate. If anyone contacts you about this case, wants to discuss the case at the time, or offers you the opportunity to discuss the case at a later time, attempts to offer any opinion on the case, or otherwise tries to influence you in any way, immediately cease such contact and immediately notify the courtroom staff. You have been given notebooks and may have taken notes during the trial. You may use your notes during deliberations. The notes are for your own individual use to help you remember what happened during the trial. Please keep in mind that your notes may be inaccurate or incomplete. If there is a disagreement about the testimony and stipulations at trial, you may ask that the court reporter's record be read to you. It is the record that must guide your deliberations, not your notes. You must accept the court reporter's record is accurate. Please do not remove your notes from the jury room until you are permitted to do so. At the end of the trial, you may retain your notes. If you do not wish to retain your notes, please leave them on the center table in the jury room. 
the courtroom staff will collect and destroy them. Presumption of innocence and burden of proof. The fact that a criminal charge has been filed against the defendant is not evidence that the charge is true. You must not be biased against the defendant just because he has been arrested, charged with a crime, or brought to trial. A defendant in a criminal case is presumed to be innocent. This presumption requires that the people prove a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Whenever I tell you the people must prove something, I mean they must prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that leaves you with an abiding conviction that the charge is true. The evidence need not eliminate all possible doubt because everything in life is open to some possible or imaginary doubt. In deciding whether the people have proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt, you must impartially compare and consider all the evidence that was received throughout the entire trial. Unless the evidence proves the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, he is entitled to an acquittal, and you must find him not guilty. Evidence. You must decide the facts in this case. You must use only the evidence that was presented in this courtroom. Evidence is the sworn testimony of witnesses, the exhibits admitted into evidence, and anything else I told you to consider as evidence. Nothing that the attorneys say is evidence. In their opening statements and closing arguments, the attorneys discuss the case, but their remarks are not evidence. Their questions are not evidence. Only the witnesses' answers are evidence. The attorneys' questions are significant only if they help you to understand the witnesses' answers. Do not assume that something is true just because one of the attorneys asked a question that suggested it was true. During the trial, the attorneys may have objected to questions or moved to strike answers given by the witnesses. I ruled on the objections according to the law. If I sustained an objection, you must ignore the question. If the witness was not permitted to answer, do not guess what the answer might have been or why I ruled as I did. If I ordered testimony stricken from the record, you must disregard it and must not consider that testimony for any purpose. You must disregard anything you saw or heard when the court was not in session, even if it was done or said by one of the parties or witnesses. During the trial, I advised you that the people and the defense stipulated, agreed, to certain facts. This means that both parties accept those facts as true. Because there is no dispute about those facts, you also must accept them as true. The court reporter has made a record of everything that was said during the trial. If you decide that it is necessary, you may ask that the court reporter's record be read to you. You must accept the court reporter's record as accurate. Facts may be proved by direct or circumstantial evidence or by a combination of both. Direct evidence can prove a fact by itself. For example, if a witness testifies he saw it raining outside before he came into the courthouse, that testimony is direct evidence that it was raining. Circumstantial evidence also may be called indirect evidence. Circumstantial evidence does not directly prove the fact to be decided, but is evidence of another fact or group of facts from which you may logically and reasonably conclude the truth of the fact in question. For example, if a witness testifies that he saw someone come inside wearing a raincoat covered with drops of water, that testimony is circumstantial evidence because it may support a conclusion that it was raining outside. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable types of evidence to prove or disprove the elements of a charge, including intent and mental state, and acts necessary to a conviction. And neither is necessarily more reliable than the other. Neither is entitled to any greater weight than the other. You must decide whether a fact in question has been proved based on all the evidence. Before you may rely on circumstantial evidence to conclude that a fact necessary to find the defendant guilty has been proved, you must be convinced that the people have proved each fact essential to that conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, 
Before you may rely on circumstantial evidence to find the defendant guilty, you must be convinced that the only reasonable conclusion supported by the circumstantial evidence is that the defendant is guilty. If you can draw two or more reasonable conclusions from the circumstantial evidence, and one of those reasonable conclusions points to innocence, and another to guilt, you must accept the one that points to innocence. However, when considering circumstantial evidence, you must accept only reasonable conclusions and reject any that are unreasonable. You alone must judge the credibility, believability of the witnesses. In deciding whether testimony is true and accurate, use your common sense and experience. You must judge the testimony of each witness by the same standards, setting aside any bias or prejudice you may have. You may believe all, part, or none of any witness's testimony. Consider the testimony of each witness and decide how much of it you believe. In evaluating a witness's testimony, you may consider anything that reasonably tends to prove or disprove the truth or accuracy of that testimony. Among the factors that you may consider are how well could the witness see, hear, or otherwise perceive the things about which the witness testified? How well was the witness able to remember and describe what happened? What was the witness's behavior while testifying? Did the witness understand the questions and answer them directly? Was the witness's testimony influenced by a factor such as bias or prejudice, a personal relationship with someone involved in the case, or a personal interest in how the case is decided? What was the witness's attitude about the case or about testifying? Did the witness make a statement in the past that is consistent or inconsistent with his or her testimony? How reasonable is the testimony when you consider all the other evidence in the case? Did other evidence prove or disprove any fact about which the witness testified? Did the witness admit to being untruthful? Do not automatically reject testimony just because of inconsistencies or conflicts. Consider whether the differences are important or not. People sometimes honestly forget things or make mistakes about what they remember. Also, two people may witness the same event, yet see or hear it differently. If you do not believe a witness's testimony that he or she no longer remembers something, that testimony is inconsistent with the witness's earlier statement on that subject. If you decide that a witness deliberately lied about something significant in this case, you should consider not believing anything that witness says. Or, if you think the witness lied about some things but told the truth about others, you may simply accept the part that you think is true and ignore the rest. Neither side is required to call all witnesses who may have information about the case or to produce all physical evidence that might be relevant. The testimony of only one witness can prove any fact. Before you conclude that the testimony of one witness proves a fact, you should carefully review all the evidence. If you determine there is a conflict in the evidence, you must decide what evidence, if any, to believe. On the one hand, do not simply count the number of witnesses who agree or disagree on a point and accept the testimony of the greater number of witnesses. On the other hand, do not disregard the testimony of any witness without a reason or because of prejudice or a desire to favor one side or the other. What is important is whether the testimony or any other evidence convinces you, not just the number of witnesses who testify about a certain point. During the trial, certain evidence was admitted for a limited purpose. You may consider that evidence only for that purpose and for no other. You have heard evidence of a statement that a witness made before the trial. If you decide that the witness made that statement, you may use that statement in two ways. One, to evaluate whether the witness's testimony in the courtroom is believable. And two, as evidence that the information in that earlier statement is true. 
Witnesses were allowed to testify as experts and to give opinions. You must consider the opinions, but you are not required to accept any opinion as true or, act or correct. The meaning and importance of any opinion are for you to decide. In evaluating the testimony of an expert witness, follow the instructions about the believability of witnesses generally. In addition, consider the expert's knowledge, skill, experience, training, and education, the reasons the expert gave for any opinion, and the facts or information on which the expert relied in reaching that opinion. You must decide whether information on which the expert relied was true and accurate. You may disregard any opinion that you find unbelievable, unreasonable, or unsupported by the evidence. An expert witness may be asked a hypothetical question. A hypothetical question asks the witness to assume certain facts are true and to give an opinion based on the assumed facts. It is up to you to decide whether an assumed fact has been proved. If you conclude that an assumed fact is not true, consider the effect of the expert's reliance on that fact in evaluating the expert's opinion. If the expert witnesses disagreed with one another, you should weigh each opinion against the other. You should examine the reasons given for each opinion and the facts or other matters on which each witness relied. You also may compare the expert's qualifications. Witnesses who were not testifying as experts gave their opinion during the trial. You may but are not required to accept any such opinion as true or correct. You may give any opinion whatever weight you think appropriate. Consider the extent of the witness's opportunity to perceive the matters on which his or her opinion is based, the reasons the witness gave for any opinion, and the facts or information on which the witness relied in forming that opinion. You must decide whether information on which the witness relied was true and accurate. You may disregard all or any part of an opinion that you find unbelievable, unreasonable, or unsupported by the evidence. You have heard character testimony that the defendant is an attentive, informative, careful, cautious, compassionate, loyal, and knowledgeable physician, and has a good reputation for financial generosity and selflessness in the communities where he lives or works. You may take that testimony into consideration along with all the other evidence, in deciding whether the people have proved that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Evidence of the defendant's good character for these traits and his good reputation for these traits by itself can create a reasonable doubt. However, evidence of the defendant's good character may be countered by evidence of his bad character for the same trait. You must decide the meaning and importance of the character evidence. Counsel for the people was allowed to ask a character witness for the defendant if that witness had heard that the defendant had engaged in certain conduct. These have you heard questions and their answers are not evidence that the defendant engaged in any such conduct. You may consider these questions and answers only to evaluate the meaning and importance of a character witness's testimony. A defendant has an absolute constitutional right not to testify. He or she may rely on the state of the evidence, and the defense may argue that the people have failed to prove the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. Do not consider for any reason at all the fact that the defendant did not testify. Do not discuss that fact during your deliberations. Do not consider such a fact or let it influence your decision in any way. You have heard evidence that the defendant made oral statements before the trial. You must decide whether the defendant made any of these statements, in whole or in part. If you decide that the defendant made any such statement, consider the statement, along with all the other evidence, in reaching your verdict. It is up to you to decide how much importance to give to any such statement. You should consider with caution any statement made by the defendant tending to show his guilt unless that
That statement was tape recorded. The defendant may not be convicted of any crime based solely on his out-of-court statements. You only may rely on the defendant's out-of-court statements to convict him if you conclude that other evidence shows that the charged crime was committed. That other evidence may be slight and need only be enough to support a reasonable inference that a crime was committed. The identity of the person who committed the crime may be proved solely by the defendant's statements. You may not convict the defendant unless the people have proved his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. If you find that the defendant made a false or misleading statement before this trial relating to the charged crime, knowing the statement was false or intending to mislead, that conduct may show he was aware of his guilt of the crime, and you may consider it in determining his guilt. If you conclude that the defendant made the statement, it is up to you to decide its meaning and importance. However, evidence that the defendant made such a statement by itself cannot prove guilt. If you conclude that the defendant tried to hide evidence or concealed evidence, that conduct may show that he was aware of his guilt. If you conclude that the defendant engaged in such conduct, it is up to you to decide its meaning and importance. However, evidence of such conduct by itself cannot prove guilt. The people are not required to prove that the defendant had a motive to commit the charged crime. However, in reaching your verdict, you may consider whether the defendant had a motive. Having a motive may be a factor tending to show that the defendant is guilty. Not having a motive may be a factor tending to show the defendant is not guilty. Charged crime, involuntary manslaughter. The defendant is charged in count one with the crime of involuntary manslaughter in violation of Penal Code Section 192, Subdivision B. The people are alleging that the defendant committed that crime based upon two theories. One, that the defendant committed a lawful act with criminal negligence. And two, that the defendant failed to perform a legal duty with criminal negligence. In the following instructions, I shall define the crime of involuntary manslaughter based upon each alleged theory. The defendant is charged in count one with involuntary manslaughter in violation of Penal Code Section 192, Subdivision B, based upon the theory of the commission of a lawful act with criminal negligence. To prove that the defendant is guilty of this crime based upon this particular theory, the people must prove that, one, the defendant committed a lawful act but acted with criminal negligence, and two, the defendant's act caused the death of the alleged victim, Michael Joseph Jackson. The people allege that the defendant committed the following lawful act with criminal negligence. The defendant, as a licensed physician, administered propofol. Criminal negligence involves more than ordinary carelessness, inattention, or mistake in judgment. A person acts with criminal negligence when, one, he or she acts in a reckless way that creates a high risk of death or great bodily injury. And two, a reasonable person would have known that acting in that way would create such a risk. In other words, a person acts with criminal negligence when the way he or she acts is so different from the way an ordinarily careful person would act in the same situation that his or her act amounts to disregard for human life or indifference to the consequences of that act. Great bodily injury means significant or substantial physical injury. It is an injury that is greater than minor or moderate harm. The defendant is charged in count one with involuntary manslaughter in violation of Penal Code Section 192, Subdivision B, based upon the theory of the failure to perform a legal duty with criminal negligence. To prove that the defendant is guilty of this crime, the people must prove that, one, the defendant had a legal duty to Michael Joseph Jackson. Two, the defendant failed to perform that legal duty. Three, the defendant's failure to perform that legal duty was criminally negligent. And four, the defendant's failure to perform that legal duty 
caused the death of Michael Joseph Jackson. A physician who has assumed the responsibility to treat and care for a patient has a legal duty to treat and care for that patient. Criminal negligence involves more than ordinary carelessness, inattention, or mistaken judgment. A person acts or fails to perform a legal duty with criminal negligence when, one, he or she acts or fails to perform a legal duty in a reckless way that creates a high risk of death or great bodily injury. And two, a reasonable person would have known that acting or failing to perform a legal duty in that way would create such a risk. In other words, a person acts or fails to perform a legal duty with criminal negligence when the way he or she acts or fails to perform a legal duty is so different from how an ordinarily careful person would act in the same situation that his or her act or failure to perform a legal duty amounts to disregard for human life or indifference to the consequences of that act or failure to perform a legal duty. Great bodily injury means significant or substantial physical injury. It is an injury that is greater than minor or moderate harm. An act or failure to perform a legal duty causes the death if the death is the direct, natural, and probable consequence of the act or the failure to perform a legal duty, and the death would not have happened without the act or the failure to perform a legal duty. A natural and probable consequence is one that a reasonable person would know is likely to happen if nothing unusual intervenes. In deciding whether a consequence is natural and probable, consider all the circumstances established by the evidence. There may be more than one cause of death. An act or a failure to perform a legal duty causes the death only if it is a substantial factor in causing the death. A substantial factor is more than a trivial or remote factor. However, it does not have to be the only factor that causes the death. To relieve a defendant of criminal liability, an intervening cause must be an unforeseeable and extraordinary occurrence. A defendant remains criminally liable for the death if either the possible consequence might reasonably have been contemplated or the defendant should have foreseen the possibility of harm of the kind that could result from his or her act. The failure of the alleged victim, Michael Joseph Jackson, or another person to use reasonable care may have contributed to the death. However, if the defendant's act or the defendant's failure to perform a legal duty was a substantial factor causing the death, then the defendant is legally responsible for the death, even though Michael Joseph Jackson or another person may have failed to use reasonable care. If you have a reasonable doubt whether the defendant's act or failure to perform a legal duty caused the death, you must find him not guilty. For you to find a person guilty of the crime of involuntary manslaughter in violation of Penal Code Section 192, Subdivision B, that person must commit an act with criminal negligence or fail to perform a legal duty with criminal negligence. Criminal negligence has been defined in the instructions on that crime. Defenses. The defendant is not guilty of involuntary manslaughter if, without criminal negligence on his part, he accidentally acted or accidentally failed to perform a legal duty. You may not find the defendant guilty of involuntary manslaughter unless you are convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that, with criminal negligence, he acted or failed to perform a legal duty. Criminal negligence is defined in another instruction. Unanimity. In order to prove that the defendant is guilty of involuntary manslaughter in count one, the people have presented evidence of more than one act or of more than one failure to perform a legal duty. You must not find the defendant guilty unless, one, all of you agree that the people have proved that the defendant committed at least one of these acts or the people have proved at least one failure to perform a legal duty. And two, 
all of you further agree on the same act or on the same failure to perform a legal duty. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop right now. As you can see, the next caption is post-trial concluding series. Those are the instructions that I'm going to give to you after the attorneys present their arguments. I can see some of you are looking at the pages. You can see it's a lot shorter than the instructions I just read to you. Uh, we think you deserve a few minutes uh, to take a breather. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a 10 or 15 minute break at this time. Of course, remember all the admonitions, the written and the verbal admonishments, and you can leave behind your instruction packet, and we'll buzz you in about 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you.